It's time for our Friday Night Spiritual Insights with Michael Mirdad. So thank you for joining us. You have sent in one kind of consistent comment or question. This is one that I've put off for a while. And, and uh, you know, I put off for maybe, I don't know, maybe 30 years to address because, honestly, it's, it's just one of the most uh, challenged topics. It's the, you know... I mean, it's probably as challenged as, as the topic of politics these days. It's about Mary Magdalene. Michael, who was Mary Magdalene? Michael, you know, um, lots of people saying, I, I was Mary Magdalene in a past life. Um, folks saying, uh, you know, was she married to Jesus? Was she this? Um, did they have children? And so on and so on. Man, it's such a charged topic. So. I'll start by saying, although some of you may not believe me, uh, I'm going to really not state my opinion per se. Um, what I'll share is just simply what's going on, why people are asking, and you know what's what's all the hoopla about, I guess. Um, so to begin with, the Bible mentions Mary Magdalene a few times, a hand, handful of times, but a few times, and. We, you know, we read about her, you know, first, it depends which gospel, but, you know, basically we're told in the New Testament that Mary, and there's actually um, references to a couple of Mary's, popular name at the time, Mary, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, and there's another Mary um, that's, that's really kind of a key figure in the um, teaching time of Jesus. But Mary Magdalene is mentioned as first... Um, She's the sister of Lazarus, the man that Jesus brought back to life. She's the sister of Lazarus and the sister of Martha, who lived in Magdala. Um, and, you know, it's kind of uh, interesting because she's the sister of, but she was raised in a family. This part's not in the Bible, per se, but she was raised in a family that was wealthy. Uh, Lazarus was quite wealthy, um, but her family was quite wealthy, even her parents and um, she just didn't like or appreciate the materialism, the shallowness or the materialism of that family. And so she rebelled um, and, and wanted to launch off and find out who she is and kind of do her own thing. That will set that aside for a sec. What the Bible does tell us is that she was the sister of Martha and uh, uh, Lazarus. And then we also read that um, she is supposedly caught in adultery and that happened to a few people during Jesus's ministry in the region and uh, you know but caught in adultery whether you believe it or not doesn't matter I'm just saying this is what the Bible tells us that caught in adultery and Jesus steps in to save her from being stoned to death because that was the um, mandatory punishment of the time now um, <clears throat> you know some people don't um, like that this this story about the prostitution potential but let, let's just Let's deal with the facts as we're told, and then we can weigh it all out later. But that's what we're told is she was arrested for, you know, prostitution. We're then told um, there's a point where she, she comes to Jesus when he's dining with the Pharisees and bursts in, which was absolutely not allowed. But this is a woman who already is different. She's got like a, I'm going to follow what I feel. I'm going to follow what's right for me. Now, whether you agree or don't agree with historical things or channeled things or whatever, one thing's pretty consistent and, and steady as she goes here is that this girl, man, she, she is, she's not one to just, you know, uh, um, follow, as it were. And that's an important piece to the story. She's really got her own ideas and her family, you know, that it starts there and then it continues here. She doesn't follow whether she is a prostitute or not. She doesn't appreciate the, she doesn't feel like a sincerity within the pharisaical kind of teachings or the religions of the time. Um, so she's doing her own thing. And, and she is said to have come in to the chamber where they're having a meal and it's forbidden, but she does it anyway. They're like, get this woman out of here. It's funny how most of them knew who she was. Um, <laughs> you, you get what I'm saying there. <clears throat> so uh, get this woman out of here. Well, um, Jesus says, no, no, leave her alone. And then he turns it on them and says, do you see what she's doing? You know, she's in here totally sincere. Now, whether the arrested as a prostitute thing is true or not, fine. 
but this one's true because this doesn't affect that story. But she comes in and she is crying because she she is she is being born again. Many of you folks watching this program when we're you know when we're doing these um, live things or when I'm doing a Sunday sacred service, so there's just so many times when I've heard you guys talk about tears coming up because of of being seen or heard or felt for the first time, connecting with something beautiful in in what we're sharing together. So that's just a man. Just imagine that times a hundred um, to understand what she would be feeling in that moment. And so, you know, she, she comes in, she's crying. She uses water and her tears to, you know, pour out onto his feet and uses that to wash his feet. I mean, I could spend an hour just on the symbolism of what's all happening in this. But man, the tears coming from the soul, washing his feet, the feet representing foundation and so forth. So she's like, and it's an act of humility so she goes and washes his feet. Then she, you know, dries them with her hair. That's <laughs> just amazing. And then, you know, she anoints the feet with oil. And it's an interesting thing because he points out she's actually doing a ceremony. She, he points out to the Pharisees, she's doing a ceremony to prepare for my death. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're sitting here and you're alive. So, you know, in a sense, he was speaking metaphorically in that, she sees who I really am. She's willing to see me beyond the human, you know, the, the Jesus, and sees the Christ in me. So she's able to see my death of the human and birth into the new. She's also, whether she knew it consciously or not, she's also somehow aware that he's going to be put to death, and she's already anointing him for that experience. So, I mean, it's just so deep. So please try to hear what's happening when I share this. Instead of having your heads on, you know, hyperactive, your mind, your heads, the intellect saying, no, this can't be, just, just relax and just try it out. One of the big problems with the story of Mary Magdalene is people with agendas, people that want to create the, the hyper levels of feminism or whatever their agendas are that are anti-male or anti-Jesus or anti-whatever, and, and trying to like create some little religion around this girl, this woman. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's fine. That's, that's your trip. But just see through it if you can. And if you don't, cool, then keep it and on your way and find Facebook groups that are really into that. But the folks that appreciate at least what I do, try to hear, I'm trying to be fair with this, but also I don't encourage agendas and that sort of thing. So try to listen. Just try to listen and see what feels right to you. And I'll explain a little bit more as we go. But that's kind of what we're hearing. And then we're hearing that uh, she's at the crucifixion, which the other apostles, they bailed. They all took off, all but one or so. Uh, and Mother Mary, too, was there. But, um, you know, they all bail for their lives. And she's like, hey, what, what life? I, have, I don't care about anything in this material world. This is the truth of God. Man, I love that. that that's, if, we, if we only had a teachings as an example of how to be a person, go to Mary Magdalene, what little we know, and hear, read, feel what she demonstrated. And it really, uh, you know, supersedes what the apostles demonstrated in terms of behavior. We unfortunately can't say it, she supersedes them in teachings because there's not really a lot recorded as a teaching. We just know that she became a mystic in her own right. We know for a fact, you know, really, that she went on to the south of France after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and a resurrection and ascension. Um, you know, and some people are, oh, no, she went to south of France with Jesus. Jesus faked his death. H how do you, you know, how do you folks, that this, those of you who are into that, I have no idea how you justify that Jesus, the Christ, lied, pretended he was dead to fool everybody or whatever it would be. I mean, just think it through. I could go on and on about how ridiculous some of this is that people are pushing, you know, but he faked his death. He took an antidote. I don't know. I don't know what antidote. Maybe there was some secret Hebrew or pagan antidote for having a spear thrust through your heart and pericardium, you know, uh, uh, until the blood and, and fluid pours out, confirming that your heart's been punctured. I don't know what antidote there is for, you know, spikes through the, you know, hands and feet till you suffocate on, you know, because your arms are pulled out of the rib cage and the rib cage contracted during crucifixions. I mean, the Romans knew what they were doing. It's not like they went, well, let's create sort of a, 
capital punishment that people could just take an antidote and be cured and come out. That's not the Romans, man. Just think it through, okay? So don't get me started on that. So um, so we do hear about her being there, but he, she's also <clears throat> one of the only people there when, during his or shortly after his resurrection. And um, don't romanticize these things. Don't, don't blow them out with just people's wishful thinking of what happens. This is just miraculous. Some people, you know, antidotes to, you know, cure him or he fakes it. Man, the dude was dead. And when he comes back to life, you know, his, his light in every particle of his being bursts to say no to the body and yes to the soul, the spirit. And it leaves a boom, a flash impression on the burial cloth called the Shroud of Turin, Turin because it's later found in Turin. Um, so that's pretty cool. Now, and, and, and even that, even, even the, 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 you know, the appearance of Jesus, you know, a, a couple of you have written in before, you know, did Jesus have long hair or short hair? And, uh, which is not really essential, but just so that we're understanding how to use our minds a little more clearly. People will say, well, men didn't have long hair in the time. I don't know, man. I don't know what, what book you folks are reading. I know that there's a couple of religions that keep printing pictures of them with short hair. Uh, you know, he kind of looks like a beetle or something, you know, in the, in the fat four days. Um, I, you, you know, that's just because they're not wanting to have men with long hair. They think it's effeminate or they think it's something else they're judging. And, and um, you know, they, they don't want to believe Jesus had long hair. But even if you could believe that the custom was somehow everybody had crew cuts in Jerusalem, um, fine. Okay, fair enough. I mean, the Romans kept their hair short because they were warriors and they needed to fight and so forth. So they kept their hair shorter. But you can imagine the Israelites were not exactly wanting to keep par to the Romans. But um, the Jesus was a Nazarene or a Nazarite. That's, that's really what he belonged to, his, his particular Essene affiliations. They were called Nazarenes or Nazarites. Uh, Samson was also one of those. And uh, their custom was long hair, actually tapered a little bit to a, a flames like cut like that, not just straight, but it was tapered slightly in the back towards a point. Um, but, um, it, uh, you know, again, I could go on and on with that, but this is just to share an example of how people take one thing and then take off and say, well, he, this is true, that's true. He also had um, a blue eyes, steel gray or blue eyes. And people say, where does Michael make this stuff up? He couldn't have had blue eyes and his hair wasn't dark like black. It was burgundy um and uh, burgundy and and um dark but there was there was gold tints to it here and there um but somebody says well how could that be and why would he have lighter skin because there were tribes of israel that had lighter skin king david is recorded as having redder hair and lighter skin so I, again i could go on and on you know disproving all these ridiculous things but just just let me just say this just stop just taking the bait with everybody's little agendas and, and sales pitches. Just come on, you know. And none of this is important really about length of hair anyway. But the more people do a disinformation, a misinformation, the more everybody stays very confused, very, you know, the mind gets very like it's just obscure. It's just like not knowing which direction to go. What do I believe? Well, if, if, if that didn't happen, then that didn't happen. Then the, I could maybe if his hair was short and his dark, skin was dark and he had black hair and Michael's wrong and so-and-so's wrong and so-and-so's wrong, then maybe it's true that these other people that come out and say, and he never walked on water. It was just a, a it looked that way, the appearance to the fishermen, you know, and the, the apostles. He just looked like he was just walking on a reef, you know, is according to some scientists who actually uh, are paid to come up with these theories. Unbelievable. But anyway, so Magdalene. You know, we know from the Bible these things and that she was at the resurrection, which I think is cool um, because she symbolizes the soul. If you look up, look, look and watch the video of mine. There's a DVD set called Mythology um, and I talk about gods and goddesses in there. But, you know, there's one myth, mythology, that's the, the root of all others. And it's the one called Sophia. It's the one that describes, and I'll just be very brief, the soul coming from God into the earth plane, getting caught in the material earth plane, then feeling shamed and, and, and um, flawed, you know, so that it, she, it's called a she, Sophia, is a she. Our soul is called a she, not a he. 
It's a she, believe it or not. So even though everybody wants to tell you that there's a conspiracy to make everything masculine, um, they're actually trying to create conspiracies to that level because they're both, both sides of the extreme argument are messed up. Um, the truth is the soul comes to earth and it's got a she, a soul feminine vibration to it, all of us. Now, <clears throat> her beloved is the Christ self that's called a he. It's neither is superior. They're both essential to blend into one. Then people twist and pervert that into becoming, there's a soulmate out there, a twin soul out there, a you know, twin flame out there that completes you. That's actually a perversion of the truth, which is still, it's beautiful that they're looking for something, but the why not, why not stop looking and find? So to find it means your soul, all of us, the female in us, needs to marry or wed or join with the Christ self. Um, and that's it. And then we go home as the bride, bridegroom merged into one, which is happening within each of us, not by finding someone else and locking them into a marriage or whatever. You know, like this is my soulmate. Now we're complete. We're waiting. We're supposed to ascend now, right? We said I do. So now we're supposed to get the I am. Nothing happens. Then you start saying, I thought you were my soulmate. I don't like you. I didn't ascend. And then now you have to find another perfect twin soul. So on and on that story goes, right? So bear with me, but the, um, the Sophia story is beautiful because she comes to earth and is, is raped and abused, which is all of us have come to this earth and experienced trauma. And then because she's raped and abused, it confirms she's now unworthy to go home. That's how the Sophia story goes, except her brother, sometimes called her partner, but her, her brother comes and says to the father off in heaven, uh, I'm going to go and get our sister. I'm going to go get my sister. So he comes here and it's called redeems her, but awakens her to who she really is, which is like Christ doing that for us. But it's also lived out in the Magdalene story. The Sophia story is played out perfectly in the Magdalene, Magdalene story because she is a symbol of our soul. Some people want to make Magdalene into like, oh no, she was a priestess in some, you know, I'm channeling that she was a priestess here and there. Yeah, well, thank you for your channeling. That doesn't mean it's authentic. But, you know, I'm channeling she was a priestess and there's people out there going, oh, I knew it. I knew it. She's a wonderful being. That's not how she becomes wonderful, just because you pretend she's wonderful. She is because of who she is, a perfect soul made in the image of God. And she gets redeemed. She gets saved. Uh, some people don't like to hear Jesus casts out seven demons from her. They go, ah, that's typical. The men are trying to say they save women. Stop with the gender stupidities, man. That's not what this is about. Get to the spirit of the message. And if this message triggers you, it wouldn't be my first, but if this message triggers you, don't watch it. That's all. Watch it if you have an open heart and you're willing to hear this because it's cool stuff. So he casts out seven demons. What that meant was he purified all seven of her chakras and awakened her. Is that wrong? Oh, no, he shouldn't awaken her because she's the master. Or she's equal. Oh, just stop. Okay, that's all defensive. I think it's beautiful. So if you believe Magdalene was an equal and he, he met her in a temple somewhere doing yoga, said, wow. That chick's got the sun salutation down, doesn't she? Wow, that's hot. And she looked over at him and said, woo, look at you. And they just hit it off and they partnered up and they just faked a crucifixion. This is what some of you believe. And they got it on and had a kid and the kid's got a bloodline out there somewhere and it could be you, me, we got to go looking for it. And uh, that's going to be our salvation, finding the bloodline as though anything material can save you. You know, if that's what you want to believe, that's fine. But but I'm, I'm saying that... If Magdalene, on the other hand, were a prostitute, just stuffed down by the authorities, ignored and, and, and despised by her family, and she still became Christed, I think that's amazing. I don't care which one's true. I'm saying for me, the one is more amazing. It's more impressive for me to hear about a being who fought through the human crap and woke up. And that to me is more impressive than one that, oh, she was already awake. She got together with Jesus. They were awake and then they conspired to lie to everybody. Um, one of them impresses me more because it means she, she 
won. She passed the test. She she did it. And she's telling us all, you can do it too. Why would that be important? Why don't we sit around going, well, who who are you to tell me there's a woman that can teach us such things, you know, and feel all, dis, you know, put down as, as males that are out there, you know, feeling that that's bad. I, I think it's great because whether it's a man or woman, somebody woke up and I think it's great. But the fact that she's a woman, she better symbolizes Sophia, which is the soul. She represents my soul. All the crap I've ever been through in any lifetime. And she tells me, you can wake up. No, man, you don't know. There's some things I've done. and You can wake up, Michael, she says. And yeah, but there's things that have been done to me. Michael, doesn't matter. You can wake up. I've been in the lowliest of low and I woke up. That's a pretty cool message. Whether it's literal, literal or not, to me, that's a more important message. But fine, you, you know, believe whichever one you want. Now, and I hope some of this is, you know, already kind of reaching you and making sense. But, you know, the Bible, uh, you know, tells us these different things about her and that she's at the resurrection. And I think that's cool that she she keeps the faith and says he's awakened. He's a, he's resurrected. The apostles are like, no way. She believes, not them. And I think that just kicks butt because anybody believed. But I also think it's cool that she did it. That's my personal thought on it anyway. Um the lost books of the Bible tell us that lost books of the Bible are Bible or are there gospels that either were not known about or discovered yet, or uh, when the Bible was being put together, they weren't known about, or sometimes they were known but voted out by the council that got together to make the Bible. Um, but the lost books of the Bible, some of them are complete fabrications. You know, some of them are just not accurate. They're not authentic. They're you know fraudulent or forgeries. But that's a minor amount of them. There are some that are astounding and fantastic and beautiful, but they were too mystical for the people at the time, so they were voted out. So the lost books of the Bible, there are some related to the Old Testament and some related to the New Testament. But those lost, lost books are, um, you know, in, in those, in the New Testament ones, you hear um, there's a gospel of Mother Mary, there's a gospel of Mary Magdalene, there's a gospel of Nicodemus, there's gospels of other apostles like Thomas. Um, that were not known about or in the Bible, not included in the Bible. And they're beautiful. They have some great, great things in them. Um, that doesn't mean you can just run off and find one and read them all. There's hundreds. And, you you know, it can get sometimes, some of them are as tedious or boring as really some of the densest Old Testament stuff, which is all fantastic to some people, but just some of it's kind of dense, you know, and heavy, you know, read to read. And so, you know, uh, the lost books, there's some material in there that that becomes interesting, um, noteworthy, you know, like, hmm. And they, there's some that say one gospel uh, that says, you know, Jesus would sometimes upset the apostles because when he would see Mary Magdalene, he would greet her with a kiss, which was not normal for the time because women were considered lowlifes to these people of the time and men were the great thing. So for some reason, you could kiss a man, but not a woman. That seems a, real, a little bit weird especially since they were really phobic about homosexuality. So it, it, the whole thing's twisted, but what isn't in, in these days and times, those days and times, and within religion and customs. So, you know, it is what it is, but they would get kind of freaked out. They would say, you know, he kisses her on the lips. Um, but in these lost books, people are taking pieces out going, see, look, he kissed her on the lips. That proves it. They were having sex, had children, etc. No, it doesn't. The translation of the word kiss is translated to actually mean shared the same breath, which could mean kiss. It could also mean you or I are on the same, you and I are on the same page. They shared the same breath. I'm not saying they did or didn't kiss. I'm saying they take, people are taking a sentence, twisting the meaning. And these are the kinds of people who are saying, the Bible's been mistranslated. We need to know the truth. But then they're twisting something too and asking us to believe that that's okay. So it's, it's all kind of weird. I mean, all of it has potential twists, you know, and perversions of what it really says. Just practice being objective. So, you know, um, they shared the same breath. Uh, the apostles, one time they're saying, you know, we're, we're confused by Jesus' relationship with Mary. Not because they're married and getting it on. They're, they're confused by Mary and Jesus because you're not supposed to talk to women even. You're, you know, it's, that's how messed up the days were. It's like he he treats her like he's one there, she's one of us and then people are going up oh, see there again she's a mystic master his equal and they're married. You got it to get into the context of it. They don't believe she should be in the room. So when he says let's bring her in the room, 
they're confused and people are now twisting that to mean something. It's very simple. So yes, he treated her differently and they're saying it's as though he loves her more than us. He responds in these gospels. How could I love her more than you? I love all of you. See, you have to know who Christ is to understand what Jesus, the person, could do with a man or woman. You have to understand, get to the spiritual meaning. Stop twisting it to be your humanistic meaning. Get to the deeper spiritual meaning and you would understand that he couldn't be doing, he couldn't like one of them more than another. So there's that. There's also references Jesus, would, they would call in more than one occasion, uh, Mary was called his companion. People say, mm -hmm, there it is. That's, that's it. Case closed, companion. The word, as it's properly translated, means my sister, my wife, or even my mother. It's, it's a word that could go any direction in that regard. And um, again, the people that wanted to go left, make it go left. And the ones that wanted to go right, make it go right. Whatever direction they want to make it, um, they're going to make it. So it's kind of unfortunate that people mess things up like that. And you guys get confusion. You've asked me for a long time to address this, but I hope you understand why I haven't. Because it's, you know, first of all, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade either direction. Um, not, not unnecessarily. I don't mind, you know, telling the truth if people don't like it, but I don't want to unnecessarily just go, you know, and just put the light on something and, and deflate people. Not at all. Um, but I also, you know, really honor that I, I don't care. Like there are people that see her as an old, the old school. She was just a prostitute. We shouldn't even be talking about her. The other extreme, she was his beloved. I don't care. I'm okay with either one. I have been among, amongst people for how many years teaching now, and I've never said yes or no to either extreme of those two options. Never. Um, I'm going to go a little more out on a ledge today by explaining some things, but that's just explaining them. I'm not telling you what I believe per se. I'm just asking you to please, you know, don't, don't buy into people's tangents and, and fads and agendas, especially, you know, in terms of what they want us to get out of this. But you know, so there's a, a point where uh, we know we read in the Bible, in the lost books of the Bible, there's a point where Peter's kind of getting a little anxious and irritated that Jesus has this woman around. And that is his issue. That's not a mistranslation. Um, that is his issue. He's being a jerk about it. And um, he then finally confronts Jesus because he was a pretty gutsy dude. Um, and so Peter says, you know, Jesus, what's this trip? You got this woman sitting in the room. It's, it's against customs. You're not supposed to have women in the room because they're not worthy of hearing the word. And Jesus's response was, then let's make her a man. <laughs> now, if you want to get off on uh, mistranslations and you want to take off with the word he kissed her and think that means they had children, take off on this one. Let's make her into a man. Clearly, he meant let's have a sex change operation. You know, seriously, guys? I mean, he says it, let's make her into a man. Then what did it mean? It meant, then why don't we learn to perceive her as worthy? The way you perceive men as worthy, let's make her worthy, not let's make her into a man, um, you know, let's make her feel worthy. So again, it's translation stuff, but it's true. Peter was getting kind of irritated and uh, not really welcoming her into the fold. And, and um, the, the apostles were men. But the disciples were men and women. We know that in the Bible. But they were apostles. They were uh, disciples. And they were men and women. And they were in the dozens and hundreds sometimes um, followers. They were like, um, sort of like you folks. You, you could say that you're a disciple of Christ consciousness. You're sort of a student maybe, though some of you, uh, of Michael Merdad. But you're not, yeah, I don't own you and you're not an apostle of mine. Um, I don't have such a thing because Christ is what I would lead everybody to anyway. So I don't have a thing for anybody to belong to. But a student, is it means disciple, means like a student of. So some of you would say, no, I just watch once in a while. And some of you say, yeah, I, I call myself a student. And that's great. Um, it's great. It, whatever that means, you know, let that have meaning for you, your heart between you and God, you know. So there were disciples. They were men and women. And it was acceptable. But the women were kind of allowed to be there just to, in, in mass, you know, not, not for the deeper teachings. And then there's a point where the apostles, a couple of the apostles said, okay, wait, we overheard Mary make a comment or two about, you know, Jesus said such and such. And they're like, we never heard him say that. Oh, well, he was telling me that when I was talking to him earlier. Well, why is he confiding really deep teachings to you? Why are we being left out? 
They actually asked her this. This is recorded. Um, you know, why are we being left out of the conversation? Why is he teaching you deeper things? We're being left out of the conversations. And she answers him. It's Peter in particular that's questioning her, but she answers him. She said, I think he tells me some of the maybe deeper teachings because he knows I'll believe it. And I'm par now I'm just going to paraphrase slightly or I'm going to extrapolate a little here, just a little bit. What, what she's saying is, my mind and heart are completely open to him. I believe anything he tells me. You, and I'm, unfortunately I think it sort of means you being men, you still think and, you know, use your heads and you try to discern what you will believe of what he says. You know, I'm going to think about that. I'll agree with him saying this and I'll agree with him saying that. Even when they wrote the Gospels, they didn't put exactly what he said. They put what they heard or wanted to hear. And she's saying, I'm, I'm just open. And I think that's just so cool. We should all be so lucky, you know. Um, my gosh, you know, just, oh, just to say what, what God tells me, I believe. You know, I just think that's so cool. God meaning in the manifestation form of a Christed one. So I just think it's cool. Um, but that's how she responds to them. And so there's a point where, you know, um, there's there, there are lost books of the Bible. There's actually a Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Nowhere in there does she specifically talk about marriage, children. There's nothing. It's other scriptures and only a few lines in all the lost books, hundreds of them. There's only a few lines. And those lines can be translated several ways. Sorry to say for some of you. But in there is a Gospel of Mary Magdalene. She doesn't say that. Why would that be? Why would she, who's involved with him, neglect to mention, and my partner, Jesus, my husband, Jesus, uh, and our child, you know. Uh, I'm writing this um, testimonial here and this testament, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and I need to pause because I have to go breastfeed my child or I have to go change its clothes or... You know, it's just not there, guys. So, you know, um, I know people are really uh, intrigued and just swept in the excitement of it all. And if it serves you, I think it's great. If it makes you into a, a, an angry person and it's only serving your bitterness because uh, of an agenda, I don't think it's healthy. But, you know, you, you'll know in your heart which one it is for you. <clears throat> but it's not in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene that much we know. So now let's... <clears throat> let's change gears for just a sec and ask ourselves, what did Edgar Cayce say? And I say Edgar Cayce because he's very biblical. He's very, you know, Old New Testament, historic. I mean, this guy's got, you know, more than anyone. He's the, the number one clairvoyant in history. Acacia record readings, nobody comes even remotely close to his um, breadth and depth of his readings and um, the accuracy. So, what we do know with Casey is he's 80 to 90 percent accurate. That, that, that's unheard of, even you know, just among psychics. Good psychics are still going to be 60 percent accurate, which doesn't sound like much, but that's scientifically impossible. That's why it's considered a gift. It's science says you can't just randomly make stuff up and be right 60 percent of the time. Uh, but that's just an aside. So Casey's accuracy 80 to 90 percent, which means to me that if he says something, there's an 80 to 90% chance that he's right. And I know people that like, they say, I like what Michael Merdad teaches until I say something they don't like. Well, what you ought to do is just discern, guys. Like Buddha said, use discernment. So you discern, Michael is what, 50% accurate? Then you should only listen to me and trust me half the time. And I wouldn't even watch a teacher that's only 50% accurate. So if you think I'm 80%, 70%, whatever it is, accurate in what I teach, then give me, give me that amount of the benefit of the doubt that I might be right. But do the same for Casey. Have some respect, you know, and, and not just throw me out or Casey out or whomever because we said something that didn't resonate mostly, let's say, with your ego. And I say ego because that's the only part that would get ticked off and toss out such teachers such so rashly. Just relax and, you know, hmm, okay. So Casey's pretty right. What did he say? He said she's from a wealthy family. He said she was caught in prostitution. He said she, Jesus brought her into a wonderful state of enlightenment. He confirms that she becomes a, a, a fantastic, fantastic role model and, and leader in a sense, just a, just a spiritual uh, a symbol. And, you know, segue from Casey. 
And there's other lost books that tell us similar things and that she went to the south of France with her family after their resurrection um, and the ascension. They go off. We know that. I mean, there are so many stories about that. And in the south of France, they don't always talk about things like children. We hear more about her arriving, her doing ministry, her being a healer, even raising people from the dead. We hear about her having a mission. But what can we believe her mission was? Why don't we ask her? Go to her gospel, man. Instead of people's gross extrapolations of a seed of something and saying, here's what it means, or they channeled it. Everybody cha it can channel all kinds of things. It doesn't mean it's right or true. So, you know, we hear um, in her gospel, but also other sources, that she, she says in, in the gospel of Mary Magdalene, Jesus is my master, not my husband, my master. I'll do anything thing for my master. I mean, she was the soul bowing in humility to the spirit. And that is beautiful. Don't put gender, the soul bowing to the spirit. I'm here to serve you. And she became a perfect depiction of the soul. You can goddess her, you can priestess her, you can, you know, embellish all kinds of things. None of them compared to being a perfect soul. You can, she was knowledgeable. She was a priestess of this temple and school. It's all stuff you're, you're channeling. But, and you might even feel it's true. That's great, guys. I'm not dissing that. But what could be greater than saying it's a soul that became perfectly humble and of service to God's will? Because that's what she did. That is a statement of the divine feminine. It's not what you accomplished. It's your presence of heart, you know, and, and, and we could go on and on about that because people just fight that because they're having so many issues with masculine and feminine. But you don't have to bleed your gender issues, you know, into spirituality. But it's, it's hijacking a lot of spiritual people and making them go off on these tangents of anger and whatever. It's just anger is never justified, man. It, you know. You're making yourself victims and fighting things. Just forget all that and get to the spiritual, the deeper significance of all these things. So Casey says she was from a wealthy family. Yeah, she was almost stoned to death. Um, and it is um, that she became kind of like almost born again, a great symbol of old life surrendering to a new life. So much of my work is about that, emptying my cup to refill my cup. Who's a good example of that? Mary Magdalene. Absolutely. I see her as a goddess because of what she accomplished, not because of studies in a temple somewhere that somebody made up and said, this, I believe this happened, I channeled it, and then I had a synchronicity that confirmed it. Well, anyway, I won't, don't want to get too far with that. Um, so that's, you know, Casey and other sources all confirming. Um, you know, and I just think it's cool. I, I love, I love the the message, but let's pretend for a moment, Michael is off, Casey could be off. What about, what does A Course in Miracles say? Because that's Jesus channeled, right? And it's a very, I mean, it's not just somebody's whim of a channeling. A Course in Miracles sold a million copies and nobody benefits from it. Uh, the woman that channeled never went on workshop tours or money, whatever, um, which is not a bad thing, but she just never did. Um, nobody gained from it. And it's never been advertised. I mean, I could go and advertise that I'm doing a class on it, but it, the publishers, never advertised it. On its own, it sold this many copies, and it's on just about every, you know, country, and in, in every country, and on every continent. I mean, it's, it's weird, because it's riding on angels' wings. It has a power of its own that's, you know, indisputable. Then you get to the channeling process, the infallibility of it, the wording. There's there's melody, there's Shakespearean pentameter that, that creates a rhythm of the wording. It is otherworldly. Let's just say that. It's not just a nice channeling. It's otherworldly, but I won't go any further with that. Um, there's lectures I've done on just that background, of course. But um, yeah, man, she's, you know, that, that was an amazing channeling. But Jesus is saying... Um, because she was sort of asking him questions at times. And he was saying, how could I have been focused on teaching the world that this world and all of its illusion, it's all an illusion. Life on earth and this world is an illusion. Bodies are an illusion. So he says in there, how could I have then 
focused on, you know, getting the hots for a girl, getting married, having children, starting a family, leaving a bloodline that everybody has to track down to find the Christ. How could, how could I be telling you this is an illusion and then want to involve myself with something that is so focused on a detail, a cell, cell, a body cell, a gene? Um, so he's, he's pretty, you know, he's, he is clear about that. So now you have to sit and go, oh, now you might not like this. If you're, you know, an angry type, you might be fighting for something, saying this is not true. What Michael's saying is not true. Great. Now you remember, you have to toss out the teachings of Jesus today and the Course, and so many other materials that are consistent. Your only background is a few mistranslated comments, and they're literally only a few, and that's creating a whole religion around it. And um, so you, you can say, I'm gonna disregard and, and dis all these accurate things, things that we know, Casey, or whatever. Uh, I'm not saying they're perfect or they're imperfect. I'm saying those sources that have proven themselves to be you know, I mean, find a fallibility and uh, find fault in A Course in Miracles. It, 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 does it contradict? Does it blip somewhere? And No, you know, it's really pretty solid. People's, you're going to found that other theory on people's loose channelings. Um, so think of, just think about it before you do. I think there's beauty to these channelings of people. Beauty. I love the love that's in it, that they love Magdalene, that they love the concept of beauty or romance. I think it's all beautiful not necessarily accurate and I won't tell you exactly what I think I'm just telling you I love you know I, I love the, the the love that these people have for Jesus Mary you know and all that more than I like the religious um, condescending judgmental attitudes of the past towards Mary Magdalene I'm all for it let's go the other route if I had to choose one if I had to choose one only one um, I would say, well, you know, if it, literally if there were two camps and the one was trying to condemn her and kill her, the, which the church was trying to do in the early days uh, through character assassination, or by the other, I'd go stand with the others. I would. I'd stand by the others, even though I know that the channelings are not always accurate and that a lot of it's been romanticized. I'd go stand with it because they're not physically causing harm. They're just bitching a lot. The other was trying to physically cause harm. And I'd stand with the other just because that's what the right thing to do is. But I am going to stay in real life here in the center and say, what have you got to say? Thank you. What have you got to say? Thank you. Your anger and, and disgust of women, I'm not into that. Thank you. So no thank you for that piece. Might have other pieces that are right, but that piece, no thanks. The other, thank you for sharing. Great. Not into really the anti-male, the bitterness, trying to, you know, uh, hold women up to higher esteem. You don't have to do anything. If women are great, let them be instead of fighting for it. Just... Be it. Practice it. Be what Magdalene was instead of trying to make it all about a, a fight of masculine and feminine. So that's kind of what I would say to either camp. Thank you and no thank you to the right pieces and go from there. Because what, what they're teaching, what their message is, what Mary Magdalene represented is far more important than whether she was married or not. And what Jesus taught is far more important than whether he was married or had long hair or short hair. That's my take. You may not agree, but that's, you know, my take. So I sit and I look at the Casey material. I look at the Course in Miracles material. And I think, you know, yeah, you know, I can kind of see where, you know, this is making sense and where it's not making sense. Um, but in summary, in all honesty, in summary, I just go, okay, you know, if we took all the sources, the, the books, the gospels, the teachings, the channel. If we took channelings, you know, if we took it all together, but leave out the ones with agendas, it starts to narrow them down a little bit. And then we would probably conclude that, you know, Mary Magdalene uh, was like most ordinary people. I mean, she was a person. She's not a mythology, she's a person. And that she became extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary. She stepped up and became something amazing, enough to scare the church and, you know, enough to also leave tidbits of stuff for people to want to, you know, embellish on. But I don't need it embellished. I can feel who she is. I don't need it. I don't need it embellished. You don't have to tell me she's a goddess, a priestess of a temple in Egypt or Britain or this or that. You don't have to make up any crap about it. You don't have to magnify it, and, you know, exaggerate. Because you do that, you're just exaggerating. It's almost like putting on dressing and then pretending that, 
you know, a skunk is an eagle, you know, you can put feathers on it and whatever. It's still a skunk. It doesn't make any difference. You dress it up. So to me, there's a light, there's a goddess there, there's a beauty there and I see it and I feel it and I don't need any embellishment. But also I wouldn't tolerate any smashing of, you know, reputation smashing either because I already know the truth. Get in the center of what you believe, Christ to be, Jesus to be, Mary Magdalene to be, Michael Mernad to be, you to be, instead of what everybody else is saying. It's, you know, part of what I've been trying to get across anyway. So I think that when you, you know, if you look at the summary of it, um, she had similar things like anybody else, doubts and fears, human stuff. Jesus went through it too. He just was awake enough to see through it and, and move forward. But, um, you know, uh, she just chose to be extraordinary. And I think that's, I just love that. I felt, I love that when you guys tell me you're going through a test and you chose to step through it. I love it. And I sometimes share those stories without your names attached, but I share those stories with groups and workshops because I think your victories over ego and fear and the world are just as commendable and noteworthy as, you know, Mary Magdalene or Jesus himself because it brings it to the here and now that human beings are fighting the good fight and coming out, you know, um, victorious in the mythologies of, you know, the stories of our life. Um, you know, when I think about it, you know, it's not, it's not really just what she taught that's amazing. It's what she pulled off in her day-to-day -day life. I mean, honestly, even if there were more clear gospels and they're not, even the one we have called the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, it's in fragments, guys. It's not complete. I don't even... I don't even know if they know how complete it is, but it might only be 60% 60 60 intact, which is, you know, there's some cool stuff, but you can't really make heads or tells of it because it, it chops and all of a sudden it's it's on a roll and then cuts. And you have to just kind of hope you got the gist of what she was saying in that moment. And when she is sharing the deepest stuff, she's quoting Jesus. She's saying, Jesus taught me this. He asked me a question, I answered this. Then he corrected me and said this. I mean, she's talking about one-on-one -on -one mini workshop stuff. You know, we were right there, he and I, and he was answering questions. We were going for it, man. This was great. And there's cool stuff, but it, again, unfortunately, it's chopped up. Um, so can't, you know, refer you to any great source along those lines. Um, you know, we, we will, at the end of the day, we will, we will all pull what we want to pull. I would just try to stay out of my ego so I don't pull ego-based stuff. But we're all going to extract what we want to extract from it. You just have to, I think you should just basically say, I, I only want to extract what resonates with my highest good. That's kind of a, a good um, rule of thumb, I guess you could call it. Um, it doesn't matter. You could say, what about Jesus? He could have been an alien teacher from Mars, according to some people out there, um, you know, on, on the circuit, touring and saying, Jesus, I think he was an alien. You can be an alien from ours. It doesn't matter. It's what the message, the deeper meaning of the message and how I apply it that matters. Whether he was born in Jerusalem, whether he was born in South America, whether he was born on Mars, Venus, or Earth, the message is what's most important. That's, you know, at least that's my take. Um, and I just think, again, you know, whatever um, is the highest good, um, you know, don't go with uh, messages just because they're, they're popular, they're fads. Um, go with what seems to resonate with what you perceive to be the highest good. And if you say, having Jesus and Mary betrothed, married, and having children for some reason, for me, is a symbol of perfection and wholeness that I'm seeking to achieve. Who could argue with that, man? That's pretty cool. Now, if you sit there and base it all on and the church they're out to get us and it was a lie and this was a lie and the truth is they used to kiss and this story out of little sentences you're trying to mistranslate it doesn't sell me on anything it doesn't impress me is what i'm saying so i hope you know i hope that's made sense and please again this takes a lot for me to go into this topic because it's so charged for people so i hope you can understand i'm not sitting here just quickly rashly flippantly blurting out some some thing you know um these two extremes i don't support but i take there's something of value there's something of value there there's also something not of value and not of value and i just let it all come to me that that seems to be consistent with the light the message of god the message of christ christ's message is it's an illusion so i can't picture him you know doing some of the things that would be part of the illusion it doesn't make sense 
Um, and at the same time, some of the things the church has tried to say about Jesus as well as Mary, um, it, they're not accurate. So you, you don't need to stay, however, in the obscure and the unknown and the frustration uh, of it all. Don't, don't say, then no, I don't know what to believe, so I'm going to toss it all. Just relax and develop the Christ within yourself. And then the things that make the most sense and are probably the most true and accurate will be the ones that most gravitate towards you. If you go chasing them, grabbing pieces and excerpts from books and mistranslating and do whatever, whatever else you want, and you bring it and you try to force it into your beliefs and gospel, then it's really not very Christy. What you did is you formed, forcefully formed a doctrine and said, this is the truth. I, I wouldn't even do that. I would just sit in center. Don't go out and get pieces and force them. I would sit in center and look at the things. What makes sense? Yes, that's consistent. The course, for example, a course in miracles seems right. So anything else that's contradicting that could be off. Even if it's only 80% right, let's pretend for a second, then the odds are already if something contradicts it, it is already suspect, suspect of being 80% off. Not the course, but the person or thing that's contradicting it. I mean, just use that common sense. That's why Buddha was saying, don't listen to anybody, just test it and see how it comes out. And what's more, he says, is if it works for you, great. Like he doesn't mean what it works for your ego and you badger people with it. He means if it changes your heart and soul and you become more like God and, you know, uh, in the consciousness of Christ, that's the ticket. Okay? Thank you for listening. And I bid you deep peace, happiness, and joy in your lives. I truly do. And uh, I thank you for joining us now and always, all the times you do.